I love it. The struggle is real in relationships, in finding a seat, in parking, and all of it. The struggle is real. How cool is that to hear the kids' ministry growing at that rate? I mean, you guys can give yourself a look. Yeah. I mean, it's your fault. You're the one. Keep having kids. I mean, we knew. Come on. It's, it, listen, we've all been through seventh grade health class. We know how this works. When you put people together like COVID did and you say, hey, you're stuck at home, we knew kids would be a few years later. Our kids' ministry would just be blowing up. My name is Lance. I'm, uh, I'm a friend of LifePoint. If we haven't had the chance to meet before, uh, I love the staff here. Uh, I pastor at a different church, actually, but I get the opportunity to come and be with you guys every once in a while, and it is a treat every time I get to be here. Uh, Pastor Rusty is a dear friend, and he'll be back up next week. So if you're new here and you're like, man, this guy was very mediocre, it gets way better next week. Pastor Rusty will be back. <laughs> And you're going to absolutely love it. We are talking about relationships of every uh, shape and size and style. For some of it, it's going to be marriages. For some of it, it's going to be dating. For some of you, it's going to be a work relationship. For some of you, this is going to hit when you're parenting. In all of these relationships, well, it's a struggle. Anytime you get people together, it can be challenging. You know this to be true. I don't need to explain it to you, that relationships are challenging, my wife and I are both licensed marriage and family therapists, and so when we fight, man, it's fun. It's, uh, it's exciting. We both know all the rules, and we both ignore them, so it's great. Like, we both, it gets, it gets real. It happens to all of us. We are all susceptible, and uh, as Rusty asked me to come up and speak, I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects. It's conflict. Conflict, because we all have experienced it. We all know what conflict feels like. For many of us, we are conflict avoidant personalities. We don't love conflict, so we just try and avoid it. We try and minimize it. We try and ignore it. And then there's a few of you in here who are conflict embracing person, and you love it. You're the people who brought up politics at Thanksgiving and just ruined everyone's day. Like, and everyone started fighting. You love controversial topics. You love to honk your horn in traffic. You're those people, like you love it. You're like, yeah, let's honk. Anytime I get the chance, my wife enjoys conflict, probably honestly in a healthier way than I do, but every once in a while we had, we had to draw the line because when I was driving, she would reach over and honk for me. <laughs> and it started conflict in the car. And so, uh, man, we, we have navigated conflict. I've sat with a lot of couples navigating conflict, families, workplace dynamics, all of it. And so today I wanted to talk through what, is, what does the Bible have to teach us? What does God have to say about conflict? And it might actually surprise you in some of it. Some of you might reinforce some uh, good habits and some of you might be challenged in some of your bad ones. You might be pressed up against some of the ways we navigate conflict, some of the ways we've inherited or seen in the past, and maybe today we can relearn what it would look like to have healthy conflict, because let's face it, conflict is unavoidable. I love meeting with people, especially couples, and they say, we just never fight. We never fight. We have no conflict. I'm like, oh, that's adorable. So you just stuff it inside and resent each other? Like, that's awesome. You just keep it right here in a little box, and then when things get really hard, you're going to spew it all out. That's awesome. And then you sit in therapy, and we all go around. So we all feel it, and how we express it might look different. But here's a big idea for all of us. Um, as we're approaching this idea of conflict and how we might take it on and how we might get better at it, um, Dr. Gary Rosenberg, this incredible uh, psychologist, said this, habitual avoidance of conflict is the number one predicator of divorce. More than financial issues, more than uh, infidelity, more than any of it. The number one avoidance of conflict is how we get ourselves into trouble. So here's uh, one point. If you're taking notes along the way, you can follow along with me. If you're online, you can open up Microsoft Word and take notes right there. I don't know how you do it. You can figure it out, pen and paper. You do you. But in the room, you were handed a little bit of notes on the way in if you want to follow along. Here's your first fill-in. Disagreement is unavoidable. But division, well, <laughs> division's a choice. Disagreement, that's unavoidable. But division, we choose to engage in division. And division can happen through a number of different ways. Disagreement, come on, that comes up through innocuous little ways all the time. We face moments that give us opportunities to be divided. It could be something that we do, something that we say or don't say. It could be a habit. If you've ever been in this room a surefire way, you know this to be true, to start a conflict. Have you ever tried 
calm down before? Have you ever said that to somebody you love? Yeah, how'd that go, <laughs> right? You're laughing because it hurts and, uh, and it stings. And maybe you even tried it today when you were telling the kids to calm down and get in the car. You were telling your wife to calm down. It's not a big deal. They didn't mean anything by it. Yeah, it didn't go so well for you because it's challenging. Other things can happen that really aren't even us. They can be external circumstances. It can be something that happens at work. It could be something that somebody said in passing that now you face the ramifications of and it was never even said to you. It could be something that we all try to navigate. Kids are a perfect example of little conflict machines. They love breeding conflict. They just love it. It's like their mission, goal, and focus. I have two kids. They're the best. I love them. I have two little girls and they're awesome. But they can sense when my wife and I have a divided front around things like dessert, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. It can be something easy, but they'll know who's the weaker of the two, and it's usually me, and they'll know, and they'll pray on it, and they'll know, and I'll give them a cookie, not knowing that they had eight cookies already that day, and then, wouldn't you know, a conflict arises. And so conflict can come from anywhere, but division, that's ultimately our choice. Here's what it says in Ephesians chapter 4, and this is where we're going to be springboarding off of for the rest of the time, because believe it or not, God has a very distinct plan for your conflict, how we're to navigate our relationships. It's all throughout the Bible, but this is one passage I want to talk about from Ephesians. This is the Apostle Paul teaching. He says this, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. How do we do that? Because it seems so easy when you read it there, but when emotions get involved, when they say the thing that they always say that just gets under your skin and pushes the button, when they call you that thing, when they don't do that thing, when they neglect that one thing that you guys have talked about so many times, being humble and gentle and unity, these all go out the window. So how do we navigate conflict well in a way that's going to honor God? In all of our relationships, whether you're in here and you have employees that work for you, whether you just have friendships that you're trying to maintain, whether you're in here and you're in the dangerous territory of trying to date somebody, which, my gosh, dating is so challenging, I feel for you, or you're married and you're trying to figure out how do we do conflict well with the people we love the most. Here's my big idea. If you end up losing internet connection or you just losing interest right here in the room, uh, here's, what, here's what I would want you to know. In healthy marriages, conflict is embraced. But unity remains the goal. It could be healthy parenting, healthy management styles, all of it, healthy friendships. Conflict is embraced. But unity remains the goal. And whether you say it out loud or not, unity is always your goal in a conflict. Unity is your goal. Because here's what you know to be true. There's their way of seeing the problem, and then there's the right way, which is your way of seeing the problem. And so if they would just come join you on team right way, we would be unified. That's it. It would be so easy. Like you just give up on all of your thoughts and come join me over here in logic where things make sense and it all seems to come together for me. And if you would just join me and we could be unified, well, (laughs) problems would be solved. So here's what I want you to do. This is a little experiment for you. You can try this at home. We're going to be a little interactive here. This is going to be great. When you go home, next time you feel things revving up again, that you're going to say the thing that you regret and someone's going to slam a door and you're going to sleep in separate places, before we get to all that, I just want you to try this line. You can directly quote me. Say this. If you would just see it my way, everything would be okay. (laughs) Why are you guys laughing? You know, that's what you want to say. If you would just see it my way, everything would be okay. But the reason you know it won't work It's because you made the mistake of being friends or being married to someone who's smart. It was your fault. Shouldn't have married someone that smart. And now they say, well, no, if you just see it my way. And you begin to entrench on either side and it just doesn't work. So how do we find unity when it's so challenging to find? Before we get to solutions, I like to bring up the ways that we usually try. And uh, I, I like to try these attractive but ultimately ineffective solutions to conflict. We've all tried them. We've all learned them. We've all, t- we've all seen them. And uh, it's just fun to, to say them out loud every once in a while. The first thing that we do is we convince. We try and convince people. I love this one. If you've ever made an Excel spreadsheet in an argument, you try and convince people. 
If you've ever brought Siri or Alexa into an argument, you just, they don't want to be involved. Like you don't need to do that. You don't need to, if you've ever Googled it, if you've searched and you just said, if you just listen, I have all the facts. Maybe you like to convince. The next one is convict. Oh, this one's fun. Come on. You're just thinking of grandma right now. You know what I mean? Well, you're not going to come. You're not going to come to Thanksgiving this year, but I don't get to see you that much. And it's so hard. And they leverage guilt and shame because it works temporarily. <laughs> Guilt and shame don't produce lasting change. You know that. But it works in this for a split second. And so what do you do? You see the guilt and shame come to you. So you go to your spouse. Hey, I know we promised it was your year for Thanksgiving, but you know, we never get to see them. And you play the same cards. You use guilt and shame and it will be different next year. And come on, you know how that ends. The next one is we coerce. We coerce. I love this one. I'm a professional at this one. And my favorite part is my wife's not in the room, so I can tell you all my strategies, and she'll never know. It's great. It sounds healthy, right? And uh, so here's, here's what I do. Here's what I do. Whenever uh, I get frustrated or get in an argument, I just get really quiet. You guys do this too? I, I get really quiet, and I start like doing the dishes or something because I'm hoping for one thing. I'm hoping for her to come up to me and say, hey, are you okay? To which I say, yeah, I'm fine. Just going to keep doing my dishes. Hey, it seems like something's wrong. No, I'm good. I'm good. And what I'm doing is I'm trying to coerce her into asking more so I can get control. And you want to know why I do this? Because I'm actually eight years old. That's why. (laughs) I'm eight. Yeah, that's what it is. I'm very juvenile. But we just, we play our silent treatment because ultimately at the end of the day, we want control, which is the last one. As long as I can have control, as long as I can have the upper hand in an argument, as long as I can maintain my way, then we can navigate conflict that ultimately gets to me winning. You know this to be true. How many times have you won an argument and lost a relationship? How many times have you won? You've proven your way. You convinced enough. You coerced enough. You ultimately got control, but no one left happy. So what do we do? How do we get to a place where, come on, conflict's unavoidable, but unity remains our goal? We've all seen people try to convince and coerce. We've seen it in our parents. It's where we learned it from. We've seen it in our friends. Heck, if we're honest, we've seen it in this country. How's that worked? When there's conflict, we try and convince or keep control. It's not working. So how do we get to unity? That's what I want to talk about today, and more than just my ideas, the Bible has some really good thoughts on this, so here's what we're going to do. First point is to be open to new information and approaches. If we want to get to unity, be open to new information and approaches. In Ephesians, it said, be completely humble and gentle. Be completely humble and gentle, which is really challenging to do when emotions come into the picture and the facts and all the stuff and the challenge. It's always so personal. So to be humble and gentle doesn't make sense. Because for most of us, in any of our arguments, we start to entrench around our opinions. So I dig on my side, you dig it on your side, and we just start throwing stuff back and forth. No one's willing to move until ultimately something breaks, and then you have to move, and then it got too far, and now we're doing a lot of cleanup work. So before we even get in the trenches, what would it look like to be humble and gentle? It says this in Proverbs 18.2, fools find no pleasure in understanding but delight in airing their own opinions. I'm just going to encourage you, you don't want to be a fool in your relationship. You don't want to be a fool who says, I don't want new information. I just want my facts and my side, and I'm just going to continue to reiterate it until you understand. And the other person says the same thing, and you have two people who may not be fools, but they are sure acting foolish to try and make this work in a conflict. So when am I going to embrace new information or new approaches? We try efforts to feign humility, and we say things like this. Maybe you've said this before. Try not to nudge somebody or nudge them. It just make it more fun. Embrace the conflict, right? I said, I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? It got so quiet last service too. It was so good. I said, I'm sorry. Why are you still upset? And what you're, you're saying but not saying is, I've done my part. Why are you still being a problem? I said, I'm sorry. I've done everything I'm willing to do. So now we can agree that you are the issue. Because if you would just stop being, 
you, we'd be fine. Because I said I'm sorry, but what I'm really saying and we don't want to acknowledge is I'm bored. I'm impatient. That you should experience things the same way that I experienced them, at the same speed that I experienced them. That you should process the way that I process. And I don't really want to create any margin for someone to do it other than the way I do it. Because let's be honest, we already talked about this, my way is the right way. And so you create this tension and this argument when really ultimately you're not open to new information. And what you've said to the other person without saying it is that you don't have the room to process the way that you need to. That you can't feel hurt anymore. That you shouldn't feel sad because ultimately it makes me uncomfortable. So your sadness and your frustration, now it's about me. And I'm over it. And I'm done. But I believe that there's something more. I believe we have another option. Simon Sinek, an incredible author, said this, the key to healthy communication is safety. And when we rush someone past their feelings, we don't create a safe environment for them to work through it. This is what God does for us every time we pray the same prayer over and over. And he says, I see the other side of it. I see hope for you. I see redemption. I see peace. He doesn't look at us and say, come on, you're forgiven. What do you want me to do? He waits, and he listens, and he's attentive. In the same way our Heavenly Father approaches us, the same way we should approach others. James, the brother of Jesus, says this, but the wisdom from above is first pure, it's peaceable, it's gentle, it's open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, it's impartial, and it's sincere. It's sincere. So, what would an apology look like maybe in a healthier way? Let's just try this. I promise you, just steal this. Just steal it. Just try it. See if it works. And if they're like, well, you're just trying what the pastor guy said. Yeah, because I care about you that much. I'm trying what the pastor guy said. And you know how stubborn I am? And it can, you can fill in the blanks from there. Try this. I'm so sorry. I can, still your, I can see you're still understandably upset. And my favorite part is not necessarily what's said. It's the period at the end. It's the punctuation. I can see you're still understandably upset. And then, this is a deep theological truth. This is why Rusty brings me in. You ready for this? This is your next step. Shut up. (laughs) Like, stop talking. Just don't say anything else. Create margin and breathing room to see, see you're still understandably upset. I don't know if I can solve it. I don't know if I can do anything about it. But I'm here. And I am sorry. And what we do from there, what would you like next? How can I help? What can I do? What are you feeling? What are you thinking? What do you need? Just, just invite those spaces because if you do, I'm telling you, this is so much cheaper than therapy, guys. It's so much cheaper. Like, it's just, what an option. When I sit with a couple, I'm, uh, I'm less worried when they start fighting. So it's kind of exciting. We just get right into the point. It's great. When I get really worried is when I see two people who've given up fighting who've embraced apathy, who said, it's not worth it anymore to argue with you. Nothing's going to change. This is hopeless. We can run down the same road over and over and over, and we're just tired. Those are the people I worry about because the apathy, the quitting, the, the lack of willingness to even engage in conflict, to be honest, that's the emotional divorce before the physical one. This, that says that my heart's kind of given up on this relationship, whether it's a friendship, whether it's marriage, whatever it may be, but I've just kind of given up because I don't see hope anymore. Another famous psychologist said this, the lack of emotional responsiveness rather than the level of conflict is the best indicator of how fast a marriage or relationship will decline. So, you ready for some homework? Some fun homework. Go fight it out, but do it well. Do it with the goal of unity in mind. Do it when the kids are asleep Do it in a way that's private and safe, but have an honest conversation. How are you feeling? What are you thinking? Are you willing to engage a little bit more? Or have we decided, you know what? There's not really room to fight. Here's the next one. You guys ready? That one got really quiet. This one might be more fun or might be spicy. Who knows? Um, Use the past as context, not leverage. Use the past as context, not leverage. It says this in Ephesians, be patient, bearing with one another in love. 
<laughs> I love the, the past. I love, if your goal, let me just tell you, I'll help you win your argument. This will help you win every argument you ever have. You ready? The past is a great way to win because they can't change it, right? They can apologize, they can do whatever, but they can't go back in time and change what they've done. So if you just leverage the past over and over and over, you're gonna win every time because they're helpless. But if the goal, listen, is not to win, because I don't think that should be our goal, if the goal is unity, the past is is pretty horrible. It gives us context, but if we use it as leverage, it really creates an unfair system to get to unity where one person feels like they're winning and one person feels like they're losing. You've never said this out loud, but you do it, I promise. We all, in any of our relationships, keep a scorecard. And I love this. You keep a scorecard of little things that you do and things that they do, and you could just keep a little internal tally of what's going on. Like last night, I put the kids to bed, and that's two points. Because <laughs> I got two kids. And one of them tried to bite me, three points. <laughs> that's it. That's it, they were fussy, and they were angry, and it was whatever, and... Yesterday, I took the trash out and didn't have to be asked. Four points. That's a big one. Now, when she asks, it's minus six points, obviously. But I didn't even have to be asked. But I came downstairs, and she had done some dishes. And so I think she did like four plates, which is like a point each, and then a pan, which is like three points. So that's like, like a little more elbow grease on that one. So you start keeping the tally, and you think, who's ahead? Who's behind? Who gets a break? Who gets this? Who gets it? Have you ever played Monopoly with your spouse before? Anybody? Just anybody you love, actually, if you've ever played Monopoly in general. This is a safe place. It's church here. Haven't we all thrown a Monopoly board in our life? (laughs) Have we all done this? Yes, that somebody has their little empire and all their fake money, and they flaunt it, and they take yours. It's just a matter of time before you take their little shoe and you just tuck it. (laughs) I'm done. And you can take your money, you can take your stuff, and you wouldn't even give me boardwalk, and you just get so mad, and you get frustrated, and you throw it. Why? Because any one of these games is designed for someone to win and someone to lose. And when you're losing by enough points, you quit. And for some of you, this scorekeeping in your relationship, somebody's winning and somebody's losing, it always changes, but when you're losing by enough, you quit. And it's not fun anymore and you declare bankruptcy, and you said, I'm done, you can have it all, I don't even care. And that posture is what kills relationships. It really breaks conflict. It's never the posture that God had for us. That's never the posture that that Jesus put forth to us. Jesus looks at us, and what's so different about our faith is that we have the opportunity not to be defined by our past, our actions, our mistakes, our hurt, the habit, the hang-up, whatever it is. We don't get defined by that. We get defined by what Jesus did and a hope for a future. What if that's what relationships look like for you? That the past isn't something to be leveraged. It, it helps us create boundaries. The past does a lot of great things. It gives us context. It helps us support each other, but... I mean, it's not leverage that we could use. It says this in 2 Corinthians. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself. Through Christ, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ. This is important. Not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to the message of reconciliation as well. Reconciliation, you got signed up for whether you knew it or not. It's like the PTA. All of a sudden, you started getting emails. And you're like, wait, how did I get signed up for the PTA? Well, now you're on a bake sale. Good luck. Have fun. You didn't even know. But for all of us, especially, well, actually, only if you're a follower of Jesus in here. I'm not saying you have it all figured out, but you've said to yourself, you know what? I want to try and follow Jesus with my life. You're signed up for this. If you're here and you're like, I'm not sure yet, I'm still trying to figure it out, we'll see if Rusty's any better next week, like, I get it. I get it. You're, you're not accountable to this. It will make your relationships better, but you're not accountable to it. For those of us who do follow Jesus, this is what we're required to do, is reconcile. And we love in our faith to talk about forgiveness, and forgiveness is incredible. Forgiveness is what we get from our Heavenly Father, even though we didn't deserve it. And we love forgiveness. And you think to yourself, I'll extend forgiveness in my relationships, And you're right, but forgiveness is about you. Reconciliation is about us. That's about unity. Forgiveness, I can do and never talk to you again. I can forgive you in my heart and we never talk again. 
But reconciliation, that takes so much more. That takes effort. What would it look like in your relationships when the struggle is real to embrace the message of reconciliation? Point number three. Here we go. I could just talk up here all day. Be ready to lean in. Be ready to lean in. It says to make every effort. In um, the Chicago Tribune, like years ago, they did this study where they asked married men and women separately if you had it to do all over again. Your spouse doesn't know the answer, but if you had to do it all over again, would you marry the same person? And uh, men answered, 77% of men said, yes, I would marry the same woman again, which isn't great, but it's not horrible, you know? Women were asked the same question. 50% of women said, I'm out. I don't want it. You can take him back. I get a redo. They were so excited. Um, Men, we got some work to do. We got some work to do to lean in in some of these moments. And I think this comes from the fact that men, when we're dating somebody, we'll, we'll say whatever. It doesn't matter. We'll say whatever it takes because we got hormones going, we got adrenaline going, we got all the stuff. So we make a lot of big promises. <laughs> and promise, I love this. Promise is originally from the Latin word promittere, which means pro, which means forward, and mittere, which means to send. So we send our intentions forward. We look ahead and we make these big promises. And when you're dating, you say silly things like, I just want to bring you your favorite coffee drink every Saturday morning and wake you up with a smile. It's like, yeah, right. Like, what are you talking about? That's insane. Why did you, I just want to take you on a date every day. This is the greatest. Make all these promises. I'll never lie to you. I'll never, I'll never stop loving you. I'll never stop. I'm like, what are you saying? Have you been to a wedding recently? They're the, that's adorable. It's like so great. In sickness and in health, it's cold season, people. <laughs> like stuff's dripping, you know? It's gross. You, like your loved one who was dressed up all pretty now is in like a cocoon of their used Kleenex on the bed. <laughs> and you're like, great, sickness and health as you like scoot them over a little bit and try and get in bed. You're like, I'm gonna sleep still on the couch. I don't even care. Like this is, like what promises do we make with the best ambitious goals, but really we have a hard time backing it up. I put it in your notes this way. Promising something doesn't make you capable. It just makes you accountable. That promising something doesn't make you capable. Come on, you're smart, you know this. It doesn't make you capable, it does make you accountable. Years ago, um, my brother called me, he lives on the East Coast, this is a long time ago, and he, um, he called me and he said, hey, I wanna do one of those mud runs. I'm gonna fly to the West Coast, I'm gonna fly over to you, and we're over there, there's a mud run in your area. And we've all seen the marketing, it seems so great. These people who market these are brilliant, it's awesome. It's just like a muddy slide, and a little mud angel, and a mud pit, everyone's smiling, and it's fun. And they're like drinking a beer afterwards, and I'm like, this is great. And so I'm like, sure, yeah, let's do it, that's awesome. Months go by. And it's the week of the mud run. And I figure I should look up like where it is, where to park, all the stuff. Because my brother's flying in, we gotta figure this out. So I look up the little website and I ask him, I say, what, what's the mud run we're doing? And he said it's called a tough mudder. Some of you know what I didn't know. <laughs> so I'm like, great. And I look it up, a tough mudder is 13 miles long. And there's not like fun slides and stuff. No, 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 no. There's like fire, like live fire, like burn you fire. And like ice water tanks, you got to swim through stuff. You got to carry things up hills. You got to do all this stuff. And I'm just scrolling through like what I signed up for. And immediately I was reminded that just because I promised something, I may be accountable, but I may not be capable that maybe for some of you, you had the best intentions when it came to your marriage and then you get into it. You think, I promised what? And now all of a sudden you're accountable, but you don't feel capable and you're tired and you're thinking, what did I get myself into? And it says this in Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. For some of you, let me just be honest, you have one foot out the door, you're confused, you're scared, it's been harder than you thought it would ever be, relationships are challenging, you're thinking if I just cut off this friendship, if I just quit my job, if I just move on to something else, then it'll get easier because I don't think I can do it. Let me just tell you that a perfect marriage may not be possible, but a healthy one is. 
that perfect conflict may not be possible, but healthy conflict is. And for all of us, I don't, I don't know what you signed yourself up for, but if you continue to lean in, the Bible's very clear, if you continue to lean in, do the work, it may be clumsy, it may be hard, you may have to apologize, it may get uncomfortable. You may have to change. Oh, gross. But at the end of the day, you will reap a harvest more than you ever knew. So in the moments when it's hard, when you're changing, when you're trying, when you're saying, I'm trying to be humble, but I don't understand. I'm trying to say the right thing, but I don't always get it. One day, there will be a harvest to reap, which leads us to the last point. Decide to do the work, or decide, rather, the work is worth it. In Ephesians 4.3, it says this, keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The relationships, you know this, take in any capacity, take a lot of work. Whether you're dating somebody, you're working through something, conflict is inevitable, division is an option, unity is possible. We all know this is the framework, at least, that we're going for. But if we're honest, you ultimately have to decide whether it's worth the work because to get new information means you have to sometimes set down some of your opinions and hear somebody out. To be patient and humble and gentle means you need to let them cry when you don't understand why they're crying and stay there. That you need to hear things about your behavior that have been hurting people and that need to change. And it's going to be messy. And it's going to be hard. But you need to decide, is it worth the work? Is the struggle, we all know it's real, but is the struggle worth it? That's up for you to decide. And I can't decide it for you. On paper, if we were taking a survey, we'd all say yes. But we're not here to take a superficial survey. You're here to decide something in your heart. Is it worth it to keep going? To have the argument that you know you need to have? To change the behavior that you've always done and gotten away with? Is it worth it? Uh, Anyone in here ever run out of gas before in your car? Like, yes, way more than the 9. The 9 a.m. is so prepared. We are just a hot mess at this service. It's great. It's embarrassing to run out of gas. It's even more embarrassing to run out of gas with your significant other who told you to stop like eight times at the gas station. (laughs) You didn't stop. and Now you're like, dang it. Now you really got to be wrong. And now you get conflict. You know what's great? When you run out of gas, you're on the side of the road. You do the embarrassing walk of shame everyone does. You walk to the nearest gas station, get the little tank, and you walk back. You know what you don't do? You don't walk to the nearest car dealership. No one walks to the nearest car dealership and says, man, I really hope they give me a full tank on this one. This is great. I hope when I trade in, get a new model, this one's not going to have the same problem. Guess what? Every car runs out of gas. So for those of you that would never say it out loud, but in your heart of hearts, in the really hard moments, you've thought, if I just leave, things will get better. You've thought, if I just move on to the next one, if I just get a new job, if I just get a divorce, If I just get some distance from my kids, it's just going to get better. Let me just tell you, you're not looking for a new car. You're looking for gas. And it's going to take work. It's going to take effort. But you need to decide if it's worth it. You've been hunting for the wrong product. And all it does is mess with your heart. All it does is entrench you into your opinion. All it does is say, I'm not open to new information. But instead, the humility to say, I'm willing to do the work to find out if this thing could work for us. And I believe... The Bible teaches that there is hope. Jesus says this in Mark 10, 9, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And I think Jesus is using his word language as a carpenter, actually. It's so interesting. Because as a carpenter, you'd have to take two different pieces of wood and bring them together in a way that withholds conflict and challenges. And it withholds being sat on or moved or picked up and shifted around. It withholds pressure. And for all of us, when we engage in a relationship, we need to decide what two of what God has brought together, no one can separate. Let's make it hold fast for us, regardless of if we have kids or if finances get challenging or if you get laid off or if we have to go to a family gathering with your in-laws, regardless of what it looks like, we will hold strong. Finally, in Nehemiah, it's my last verse, then I'll close. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your families, for your sons, for your daughters, for your wives, for your homes. Fight for them, but fight 
with the goal of unity. Not to be right, not to win, not to coerce or convict or control. No, fight with the goal of unity. And when we do that, not only do we find healthier relationships, but we begin to align ourselves with what God has called us to. The ministry of reconciliation, of hard work, of looking at another person and identifying their value. If we can figure this out, I believe it can not only change your relationships, it can change your faith. It can change the way you see a God who loves you. Let me pray for you as we close. Heavenly Father, thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you have made the first move in this whole scenario, that this isn't something you just challenge us to do and then sit back at a distance and hope it works out, but instead you've showed us with grace, compassion, humility, gentleness, peace, joy, unity. You've showed us what that looks like through your son, Jesus. And you continue to show us through your Holy Spirit. You continue to show us a way towards peace. So let us be aware. Let us make an effort. It might be clumsy. It might be unnatural. We're going to have a lot of things to unlearn. But in this process, Heavenly Father, would you give us your peace? When arguments begin to rise and conflict takes us to a place where we just feel so separated, would you remind us that conflict can be a pathway to unity, to understanding each other more? Give us peace grace when the feelings rise, when the voices rise, when we're tempted to do what we've always done, show us a new way. And when we see that new way, we will see a glimpse of you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.